she said she was sitting out on the stoop with her mother. And who should roll up but homeboy? She says, this homeboy is a little corny, but he's fun. And he shows up in a brand spanking new bright red BMW M3. Now, where did homeboy get that? You gotta ask yourself. And she doesn't ask herself. She's just like, oh, cool. And he's like, hey, where, where are you trying to go? Like, I'm going to give you a ride. Where do you want to go? You want to ride with me? And she's like, oh, yeah. And her mom's like, I wanted some French fries from McDonald's anyway. Why don't you go pick those up? So she hops in the car with Homeboy and his brand spanking new BMW M3, and they just drive off. Never once does she go, you know what? Homeboy doesn't have the money, doesn't have the means, doesn't have family. How in the world did he get this car? No, she doesn't ask herself any of the right questions. And then she wants to act like, danger, just found me. Like, your, your friend rolled up in a brand new car, he has no means to get it, and you get into the car? At what point were you gonna go like, he stole this? My name is Tia Denise, welcome to my channel. Here we are, worthy again. This chapter goes by the name of University of the Beemore Streets. Beemore being Baltimore. And so begins the chapter that has more foolishness in it than any we've come to yet, but it's a different kind of foolishness than the prologue. This is where gentrified Jada tries to go back to her gangsta ways. And the entire chapter is plagued by misspellings and just turns of phrases that I can guarantee you she doesn't actually use in daily life. But this is all a return to the 1980s drug street of Baltimore and she wants to let you know she was actually there because listen to how authentic she sounds. Now, I'm just, just as a warning, you guys, I'm gonna sound like a real fool reading some of these passages. This is gonna be a real Ben Shapiro reads the lyrics to WAP type situation. But I'm sorry, that's what is written. She has invented a whole new set of spelling for a whole new set of words. So <laughs> I can just promise you, this is gonna be a weird chapter. Um, in this chapter, we are going to be introduced to a pivotal character in her life, at least one that she would like you to believe is a pivotal character in life, and that would be one Mr. Tupac, who she refers to simply as Pac. The first time I read that, I absolutely died laughing. Who in the world went around calling him Pac? I'd like to know. I don't know, is that like a legitimate nickname that he had? I'm not real familiar, but really, Pac? Like everything that she can possibly shorten and like turn into a little, little nicknamey thing, she does. It's just this outsized effort to just remain so cool and like so like hip and like just so unbelievably unreal as a human being. I don't know anyone who would legitimately walk around talking like this. And especially somebody at her age, it just feels like she's trying so hard to prove that she's legitimate, that she this was a legitimate part of her life. She really was slinging dope. You know, it's like, okay, so you say. But it's just shocking to me that her life could, on the one hand, be so disheveled and a mess with her mother being the outrageous addict that she's going to be real to be in this chapter. And then somehow she just manages to just foray herself into Hollywood and have a leg legitimate acting career. And she meets and marries a really profoundly famous person. And, you know, I know a lot of actors and actresses have really shockingly chaotic lives as children. So maybe it's not that weird that she managed to be successful with such a difficult past. But the choices that she chooses to make in this chapter are so irresponsible, so blindingly ignorant, that it just feels like, how could you have been making such poor decisions and yet fallen ass backwards into success the way you have? Maybe that's why she is so proud of herself because she knows she was being an idiot for the majority of her life, and yet somehow she's managed to succeed. Um, anyway, one final note before we start this chapter. And you guys, by the end of this chapter, tell me if this bothers you too. The entire time she's romanticizing her time trying to be a drug dealer, and perhaps was a successful drug dealer. We never get into the pinnacle of her success in this chapter. It's really more like the starting out of, and why did she begin, and the necessity for her to choose this lifestyle. But the entire chapter romanticizes this street life, you know, and she'll be like, it was real tough. We were all orphans, you know, maybe not in the traditional sense, but all our parents were just completely high as kites laid out on the bathroom floor. So basically we were all orphans, you know, slinging dope in the streets. And it's like, 
okay? But you're choosing to perpetuate a lifestyle that you are suffering from. Why would you choose that? I don't understand it. And even as an adult, as she's writing back, there, there doesn't seem to be any insight. There's no depth of understanding. It's very, very reminiscent of Harry's uh, memoir. Because Prince Harry too was charmed by who he was as a child and couldn't seem to explain from an adult perspective or put any insight into why he had done the things he had done and rather he was charmed by it. Do you remember when we read Spare and he made like enormous fun of this poor deformed woman who took care of him at the boarding school and he said that they all mocked her and made fun of her and caused her problems and not one time in the entire passage was there any regret for his behavior. Well, that's how I feel about this chapter with Jada. She just keeps talking about all these wildly outlandish, poor choices she's making, and not once do we see any regret at all about what she had done or why she had done it, or even like sadness that she felt forced into this lifestyle. It, over and over and over and over, she says, it was a choice. I chose to do this. I chose to do this, but not any kind of like, but I wish that I hadn't. I wish I'd had an adult who could steer me away from it. Oh no, she's charmed by herself this entire chapter. So, um, I know some of you guys have been like, peace out on this book. I can't, I can't manage Jada. And part of me is like, I get that a lot. And I too, I'm like, can't we just read about Britney Spears? But I started this book and I have to finish it. Um, so I can't wait till we can finally get to Britney Spears book. Cause I feel like we all feel a lot more sympathetic to her and her situation than we do to Jada. Britney, I feel like has been victimized since day one. And you know, I started reading the book and it's good. Um, and she's not trying to be pretentious. And I think that that's what I am so happy about with the Britney Spears book is that she's just like, this is just me. I, you know, if you don't like it, I don't know what to say. You know, wh whereas these other memoirs and books we've read, it's these people who desperately need us to like them. So we end up despising them for it. So can't wait for the Britney book, but we got to keep going. And you guys cannot abandon me through this. Okay, don't make me read this by myself. All right, here we go. Chapter four, University of the Beemore Streets. Get your buckets, friends. There's a lot of gag-worthy content in this one. She says, my midnight forays to go hang out with my boyfriend at the 7-Eleven came to an abrupt halt in the fall of 1985, once the school year began. To this day, I cannot believe I kept the routine for so much of the summer, considering the Baltimore city landscape at the time, which was far from the charm description of Charm City. This is Baltimore, where you got to be more careful. Don't get it twisted. This ain't Maryland. This is murder land, as in murder land. Okay. By the mid to late 1980s, Baltimore was becoming known for having one of the most dangerous inner cities in the country per capita. She said this was especially true for kids my age, 14 and 15 years old, who are among the most likely in the country to be murdered by peers. She says it was became the norm that you could just get murdered if you stepped on somebody's sneakers or you didn't give up some of your stuff or you didn't give, you know, away your leather jacket, you know, that's deserving of a shooting. I'll stab you to death. She said one of her friends was stabbed to death with a kitchen knife in a family fight. A family fight, you guys, not even a street brawl. She said hair salons uh, seemed like a common place for dudes in jealous rage to gun down their girlfriends. She says that we got jacked if we were too fly in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let's not even get started on the drug game and the treacherous murders that inspired. We'll get to that. Don't you know we will? She says that she and her mother had been reduced to living in this row house on Prince Street after Tony left them. That her mother was able to scrape together a small down payment to put on this roach infested dwelling. And that it was okay because they're in proximity so to some of the nicer homes in the area although their particular house was just a hellhole she says this was life now this was what we had been given and the streets of Beemore were an initiation it's really shocking to me that she seriously continues to call baltimore Beemore. i don't understand that one she says you know to make your way if you were young and black the streets were unavoidable the curriculum this university had to offer set you up to fail if you let it the University of the Beemore Street seemed to offer opportunity, a way to make it big, and for some, to be on top. I took those streets to find my come up. You know, and throughout this entire chapter, she's really captivated by this uh, analogy that she's created. The University of the Beemore Streets had a real, real hard curriculum. Sometimes it would cost you your life. But all right. She says after the double blows of her mother's death and Tony's departure, her mother just fell into a deep, dark depression and her addiction just took over. 
It was apparent now that Adrian was in the throes of her addiction and was mostly unavailable, leaving me, for all intents and purposes, on my own. In my community, there was an epidemic of orphaned children and teens. Maybe not in the traditional sense of orphan, but we had to figure it out without parental guidance. We had to grow up before our time. She said that you just had to find a group of friends to sort of like parent each other through life. If you didn't find your clique, you were going to be a real lost soul. And in fact, she says she lost her virginity at the age of 14. And it was late for her to have lost it then because most of her friends had been sleeping around with grown men for years at that point. <laughs> what? And she said that the adults, you know, none of them had any idea what the kids were up to. She says that the adults assume they were, you know, doing the right thing. But why would the adults assume that? You know, the adults were doing drugs and just hoping the kids were somehow receiving parenting that they had never given. Okay, so of course the kids are, are wilding out and sleeping around. Um, she said that you had to get a clique of friends around you to build some kind of a family. And she said home was no longer a safe place. And she decided that the only way forward was to make her own money. Well, she had a series of legitimate jobs. So she didn't go straight from, hey, I feel untethered to as she would say, sling and dope, but she did, um, but she did know that she needed money. So she went, she got a series of jobs, but she also did a series of other things that were just really foolish. She says that she got, became habitually walking to the edge of danger every night because the adrenaline of it was so exciting. She became addicted to that. She said that her mother was never around. Um, either she was at work all night long or she was high all day long. And so no one was watching Jada. She could pretty much do her own thing. Now she says that there was a lot of trouble for her to find during the hours of her mother's work shift and when her mother was high. But then she also wants to let you know that it wasn't always her fault because sometimes Xavier just found her. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine making all of your friends some of the most troubled individuals on the streets and then trouble finding you through those people. Who could have predicted that? Well, one such event happened. She said she was sitting out on the stoop with her mother and who should roll up but homeboy. She says this homeboy is a little corny, but he's fun and he shows up in a brand spanking new bright red BMW M3. Now, where did homeboy get that? You got to ask yourself. And she doesn't ask herself. She's just like, oh, cool. And he's like, hey, where, where are you trying to go? I'm going to get you a ride. Where do you want to go? You want to ride with me? And she's like, oh, yeah. And her mom's like, I wanted some French fries from McDonald's anyway. Why don't you go pick those up? So she hops in the car with Homeboy and his brand spanking new BMW M3. And they just drive off. Never once does she go, you know what? Homeboy doesn't have the money, doesn't have the means, doesn't have family. How in the world did he get this car? No, she doesn't ask herself any of the right questions. And then she wants to act like, danger, just found me. Like, your your friend rolled up in a brand new car. He has no means to get it. And you get into the car. At what point were you going to go like, he stole this? I mean, at what point were you just going to be like, oh, wait a second. No, but she wants to just be deer in the headlights. Like, oh my gosh. Because who should come roaring around the corner behind them but the police? Obviously. So there they are riding down the street. Woo. Here come the police and she writes in all the dramatics of a seventh grader after a few minutes of hitting the main drag woo, 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 here come the cops capital c capital o capital p capital s from two directions with lights flashing and sirens blaring next thing i know my homeboy who i will find out had picked me up in some mfing stolen car guns the gas pedal and speeds off launching us in a full-blown chase this is the kind of shit you see in movies with a swarm of cops and helicopters chopping it up overhead. Now this dude's not phased in the least cause he's a car thief, pro. I'll find that out later. What the F is going on? You are gonna get us killed. No, I'm not, he shouts back calmly. He is calm. His being calm makes me believe he has a plan and it's all gonna work out. But the problem is we're in a full on chase and I've never seen a car chase in the movies where the people actually get away. Somehow he manages to ditch the police. Instead of finding some alley to hide in, too obvious, he pulls off into a residential cluster of streets. And he tells me to get out of the car. And then he tells me that if anybody stops me to say that I was just walking home from a friend's house because we were watching movies. So then I did. I hightailed it through the neighborhood and I hid in somebody's backyard and I waited for the police to leave. When it felt safe, I went home. But just as I was walking home, who should stop me but around the corner of my house was the police just waiting to get me. 
you know, so apparently the police knew exactly where to find her. And they're like, hey, where were you? What's going on? Where's the boy that you were with? And she tries her sorry line. I'm just going home from a friend's house. We are watching movies. And he's like, no, that's not true. Get in the back of the police car. So she goes down to the police station. And of course, she doesn't know anything about anything, you know. And she didn't know anything about anything. She didn't. I mean, intellectually, she could have figured out that the car was not the boy's, but he didn't tell her that. She wasn't with him when he stole it, so the police let her go. But she learned something from the University of the Be More Streets. Big lesson here, don't ask questions, ever. The less you know, the better. I find out only after the fact that this dude was a much sought after car thief. What would I have said if I'd known the car was stolen? Thank God I didn't know nothing. Nothing, you guys, N-U-T-H apostrophe N. That kept me safe and helped me keep my homeboy's business out of my mouth. Gotta keep stuff out of your mouth. When talking to the police, I truly had nothing to tell them. Note taken for this part of the curriculum. Gonna pass with an A on that one. Come to find out the police had been on my homeboy's neck for months. He'd been in foster care, he was now in juvie. He was simply another orphaned heart trying to graduate that university to be more streets. Y'all, I didn't even make that line up. That's actually a line from the book. He was just another orphaned heart trying to graduate the University of the Be More Streets. That's how goofball this book is. She said, funny enough, the incident may have caused my mom to question me less for a time because I had done nothing wrong. Of course, that wouldn't always be the case. Now, she goes on to say that she had begun to attend the Baltimore School of Arts. And she'd been attending the Twigs program there for about a year. Now, this school was fairly new it had only been established in 1979 so only like six years old but they had these two historic buildings that they housed this 400 students in and she said that it had the feeling of being hallowed halls even though it was a fairly new school she said that she chose to audition for acting it's a public school but it's one of those fine art schools you have to audition to get in and she auditioned and she did make it in it was prestigious in the sense that it was difficult to get an audition and it was difficult to be selected from all the children who did audition. She said, acting was always the thing I most excelled at and seemed to be a viable professional path, although my passion for self-expression lent itself to a range of other interests. Whenever possible, I'd take every dance class I could. Modern, ballet, African, jazz, you name it. I love visual arts too. And because voice like movement was so much a part of the actor's instruments, I managed to get vocal training as well. She said that the teachers were great she mentioned one man specifically who was head of the theater department. His name was Ronald Hicken. Ronald Hicken is the worst, in my opinion, because he turned a blind eye every time she was absent, which was a lot. She says, yeah, he was a cool guy because he like just didn't even care if I didn't show up. You know, he just, you know, he didn't give me a lot of grief about it. I'm like, well, he bloody well should have given you a lot of grief, quite honestly. What are you talking about that that was an indication of an adult who cared about you? The indication of an adult who cared about you would have held you to a standard and said, get your ass in here because... I want something better for you than the University of the Be More Streets, you know? <clears throat> She's like, he's a cool guy. He never really made a big deal when I never showed up to class. He was probably happy when you didn't show up to class because you sound like a clown, always needing everyone's attention all the day. All right, well, anyway, she said he his willingness to turn a blind eye to her absence was helpful when she and her friend Corey Washburn decided that they were going to head up to New York City to visit their friend who turned professional actor Josh Charles. If you don't remember Josh Charles, his breakout role was in the Dead Poet Society. And apparently he'd had some breakout role in the movie Hairspray. So they'd gone up to see him. Here was a real actor. Here was the person living their dreams. And he was only too happy to show them around. But of course, Jada didn't just ask her mother, hey mom, can I go? No. No, she doesn't ask her mother. Why would she do that? You know, she's just gonna go ahead and do it because that's what needs to be done. So she and Corey Washburn cook up this plan. They'll tell their parents that they have to go to New York for this school workshop on something called the Alexander Technique. And they know that their parents won't question them. Their parents don't question them about anything. So it works. She says, mom, I gotta go to New York for this Alexander Technique workshop. And her mom was like, okay, whatever. Doesn't even ask about logistics. She's just like, when do you need to be dropped off at the train station? I'll drop you off. And so Jade is like, score, you know? So she and Corey Washburn get up there. Now this is where the story starts to take a weird turn because I don't really understand how any of this was negotiated and navigated and, and figured out. I just didn't really doubt this next part of the passage or or else people had or were using messenger pigeons or something in order to get messages to each other in a timely fashion because I don't see how this next part of the story could possibly be true and I feel like she just did it for the drama of it she says that they went up there 
that they had a great first day and a half, but then lo and behold, who should finally decide to rise up and care about where the students were, but the school. And they phoned Jada's mom and said, hey, Jada's not here, where is she? And her mom was like, oh, she's up in New York at that Alexander Technique workshop. And they're like, there's no such, and she isn't. So then her mom starts freaking out. You mean Jada's in New York and no one knows where she is and no one knows what she's doing and my baby's walking the streets in New York City? Finally, Jada's mother decides to rise up in her maternity and do something about her wayward child. So somehow, beyond anything I can comprehend, she manages to track down Jada on the streets of New York, but not in person. Somehow, she figures out where Jada is, then gets Jada to call her on a payphone in New York. And it's like, but how was that maneuvered? How did Jada know she was supposed to call you because you were angry? You know, it's like, she's like, my mom got a message to me that I was supposed to call her from the payphone. What? How? You know, so it's, it's all very vague. And I'm like, I don't know how that even happened. How did your mother manage to pinpoint your location and then actually get you to call her on the phone? Well, you know, so then we've got the requisite passages about, you know, the black mama screaming at her child, telling about, you know, get your ass back home kind of talk. And it's like, all right. You know, it's just like, again, Jada's like, you know, I really had it. You know, my, my mom about took the hairbrush to my ass. And it's like, okay. I mean, it's like, what is this talk? You know, I, I can't. anyway, so she says that they managed to convince the parents that they're sorry they go on the next train home the next morning and of course her mom's there to meet her at the station in all her rage and indignation and you know jada ends the passage with adrian is pissed to this day okay it's just like such a uh, like you can just tell throughout the entire portion of this book this chapter that Jada is so charmed by herself. Like she just is like, I was just so wild and crazy. I just did my thing, you know? You know, consequences be damned. I just, I was just loving life. Cause that's who I am. I'm a queen. I've always been a boss babe. Just doing it, just figuring it out. Just rocking the streets. It's like, all right, Jada. Anyway, to continue. She says, um, there's nothing like walking into a poppin' club when you're 15, 16 years old, no ID requested, and you feel like you own the spot. It's dark, it's moody, it's all kinds of possibilities await. And she goes on to say that she really enjoyed the house music in Baltimore with uh, such specials as How You Want to Carry It and Pull Your Guns Out and the dominatrix sleeps tonight and it's time for the percolator. Okay, so she's bebopping to some tunes. She wants to let you know she was tomboy cute back in this time with pink hair, baggy jeans, a pair of fresh clean Reebok princess sneakers. She said, my style set me apart. She wants to let you know that at this time she wore her hair shaved up one side with a rat tail down the back that touched her butt crack. That's, that's how she phrases it my long rat tail that reached my butt crack. I don't know why she had to explain it that way, but that's the mental picture she wants you to have. She says that she was real into these dance battles, you know, with all of her awesome dance training, she really never failed to wow the crowd. Um, there's a, several pages on that. Um, you know, she lets us, she talks more about her street style, you know, what, what she liked to wear that really made her uh, unusual. Uh, it all sounds pretty um, standard. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like the character on any Cosby episode that was supposed to be like the street smart friend that shows up. That's what it sounds like. Okay, the club skating rinks and parties weren't only for fun and good times, but they were also where I would meet some of the more learned professors at the University of the Beemore Streets. She said Baltimore was infested with every kind of drug back then, but heroin reigned supreme. It was also a time when legit jobs that used to support families, connecting communities, were vanishing, major industries were shutting down, and it was all leaving less opportunity for working class folks and young people. Many would turn to the drug business to make ends meet or for a quick come up or even to support their own habit. 
She said that though heroin had been the thing, then crack began to take the streets because it was easy and it was cheap to make. And it, said, it was said to be a lot more addictive than even cocaine. So that's what began to take hold of Baltimore. She says, the idea that I could gain some financial freedom by selling drugs just seemed practical to me to make a way for myself in a landscape where so many awful things were happening. Yeah, and then she goes on to describe some of the awful things, but she needn't have looked past her front door to find out the awful things as her mother lay in a stupor. You know, and it's just, once again, the inability, the, the lack of forethought, the, the lack of ability to connect the dots to your situation to what's going on outside the streets, to be like, my mom is out of her mind. She can't even have a conversation with me because she's passing out in the middle of it. I think I'm gonna go and sell drugs to some more people some, so some more people can have homes like this and so that my mom can continue to be like this. You know, I mean, why would she have wanted to join this culture? Why would she have been like, I'm getting out of here. I, I don't want this, I don't need this. I have a coveted spot at this school that could help me. I can make connections there, I can get out. You know, but to be like, home's crazy and I have this great spot at school I kind of show up sometimes when the spirit leads but most of the time I'm just over here looking fly with my rat tail hair down to my ass crack and slinging dope oh, I, I, maybe it's parenting like being properly parented that helps you to look into the future and maybe that's what I'm not being fair about here like I want to be like how come Jada wasn't like looking around her surroundings and being like okay two plus two makes four and I don't like four so I'm getting out of here you know Maybe that's parenting that helps you do that. And maybe I'm being really, really unfair to be like, why couldn't she also come to that conclusion that she should want to get out of there? You know, um, is it good parenting that leads you to be able to look around? But I, I don't necessarily think that that has to be in the equation because I've heard of many stories and I know many people who have looked around and said, I don't like this. I'm not going to do whatever created this. I don't want a part of it. I'm going to make my own way in the world. And Jada was set up to make her own way in the world in the fact that she was going to a really good school with people who would have helped her to progress forward. Obviously they do help her. There's no other way she could have managed her career without this piece in her background. And so I'm just like, how much was she leaning into the drug business and how much was she actually leaning, leaning into school? But she's trying to act like, I just partied and I was crazy and I was a drug dealer. And then you know what? Then I, then I was you know in Hollywood. You know, how much of this is her just romanticizing her drug life and minimizing school because she thinks that sounds cool? Like the person who's like, yeah, I went to college, drank the whole time, made straight A's, never studied once. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the vibe I'm getting here. She says that the entire city was wrapped up in chaos and a nightmare. And she gives an example of one time... She says, one of my homeboys was shot multiple times and left dead in the middle of the street from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. the next morning. I'll never forget the sound of his mother and sister wailing in the streets all night as they stood by his body. There is a certain kind of quiet that hits a place in the aftermath of murder when the morgue is not willing to come to that part of the town to retrieve the body of a young man stolen by violent bullets. Even the hood has its own way of mourning and paying its respect when its own is left to rot on the concrete under the midnight sky. This was real life, brutal and unfair. Okay, let's just pause because hmm, the hood is quiet now because everyone has scattered lest the police does decide to show up. I wouldn't say that it's a holy morning for the person who's been stolen by these violent bullets. God knows where they came from. Just rained out of the sky, these violent bullets. Jada, you are in the hood where people are shooting each other for drugs and you want to act like there's some kind of nobility in the entire thing. Here my homeboy was on the ground, stolen away by violent bullets, and then the hood mourned him with silence. No, the rats have scurried to their hole lest the police show up. I, I just can hardly believe that the morgue would let a body lay in the street for six hours and nobody would come to collect it. I feel like that, I mean, apart from the fact that that is just a human rights violation to leave a body of, a fa of the family members lying in the middle of the street, it's a health issue to have a dead body in the street. So it's just like, I call BS on that whole story. But even if that were true, if that, if that is true, if, they, if all the systems had collapsed to such an extent that we were basically in a third world country where the dead bodies are left in the street until somebody can be roused to pick it up, why would you want to perpetuate this kind of existence by joining it through drug dealing? But she says, hey, you know what? Maybe it was a selfish decision that I wanted to, but that's just what I've been driven to. She said, the best you could do to win 
was to join the game by any means necessary. And is that selfish? Yes, but that was survival. These kinds of doggy dog conditions can turn anyone selfish. So don't question her. Why should she have risen above her circumstances and gathered some different intel and figured something else out? Everyone else was dealing drugs, so why shouldn't she? But by the way, you should know that she didn't want to just deal drugs be from her drug dealer boyfriend. You know, she wasn't anybody's mule. You should know that she was looking for a new way to do it. And that was she was going to be the drug dealer. She wasn't going to be anybody's girl who was, you know, dealing drugs and being his mule and walking the streets for him. You know, when he decided to give her a handout of clothes and jewelry and a place to stay under his abusive hand, that wasn't what she was here for, you know? So maybe she was gonna deal drugs, but she was gonna do it in the Jada Pinkett way. Don't you forget. She said, if anyone's gonna give me the trappings of the good life, it was gonna be me. I came to the conclusion that I could be as successful a drug dealer as any man. In my view, I could work my way to running the whole operation and be a queen pin. Queen pin, don't you forget that. I think it's interesting that she should use the term she wanted to give herself the trappings of the good life. I know she used that phrase because that's just a phrase, but let's break it down. The trappings of a good life means that you are your own abuser because you are the one who's created all of this necessity for and this need for this material lifestyle. You are the one who is caging yourself in with things. Trappings is a very intentional word. It's an oxymoron, the trappings of a good life. And it's interesting that she wouldn't want somebody else to be abuser, but she doesn't mind abusing herself by becoming addicted to things and to a certain status and lifestyle, driven by criminality. She says, here's a deal. A generation earlier, the strivers became doctors and lawyers like my grandfather and Tony. Now the most successful people in my hood were drug dealers. They had the life we all wanted. If you were strong enough and if you could survive, it could be yours too. But Jada, it's not an equal kind of career choice. And that's what's so weird to me is that she is, as an adult, talking about, yeah, one, at one point you could be a doctor lawyer, but now there's a new career option. It's a drug dealer, you know? And it's like, okay, well, one of those is legitimately contributing to the community and one of them is legitimately taking from the community and killing it. One can look at himself in the mirror and be like, I worked my ass off to get this job. And the other one's like, I am giving up nothing and taking everything. And it's just like, how, how, can, how can she even see like, yeah, it's just a different time. They're just different career options, you know? She said, these attitudes collided with my growing concerns about being left to fend for myself because her mom was such a raging heroin addict at this time that it was completely possible that any moment her mom might just drop dead. And her aunt Karen had even asked Adrian for parental rights in the event that something should happen to Adrian. What was hard for Jada was that her dad and her aunt had both become sober at this time. And with them, she'd attended a lot of the NA meetings. And she'd seen people have major success with the 12-step program. She said that when she would go to the 12-step program, she'd hear all these amazing stories about how God reached into people's lives and by the grace of God changed people from their incredibly horrible circumstances. She said she heard stories about people who had lost their families, their jobs, their homes, who had even sold their children for drugs. And yet, through the grace of God, he had uplifted them to a better lifestyle and ended to sobriety. So she loved these stories and they were really empowering to her. But the problem was she had been risen to hope so many times and let down so many times by Adrian. It just became to create this feeling of apathy about the whole situation. Mom's never going to get better and I'm going to have to figure out my own way in the world. And you can see how she came to that conclusion. And I don't blame her for becoming apathetic about it. You know, you can only care for so long and then your emo emotional resources just run out, you know? Apathy is a completely normal response to the situation. And it may have been apathy that chose her to take the path of least resistance, that being that of a drug dealer. A lot of people right around you can show you exactly how to do it, but there's not as many people leading you out of the ghetto. But everything became even more heightened and more concerning because of two incidences that were gonna happen in her life. The first one was that one time when she was at work, her mother showed up. Her mother was high as a kite, so high that Jada was trying to figure out how her mother even got there in the first place without having an accident. Her mother wanted to come in and put a leather trench coat on layaway for Jada. And her mom was like completely out of it. 
the owner of the store comes over to talk to Jada's mother. They knew each other. So he was just come, coming over to say, hey. And Adrian was falling asleep on her feet, like just totally zoned out. And Jada says that she'd never been embarrassed by her mom in public before. But this was the first time her mother had ever done something like this. And she was felt so much shame. Her mom roused herself after Jada shook her shoulder and was like, Ma, are you okay? And her mom's like, yeah, yeah, I'm just really, really tired. It's a long shift last night. I'm okay. She pays for the coat and then she leaves. And everybody in the store knows exactly what just happened because everybody in the store's lives are also touched by addiction. But nobody says anything. And it's just this awkward, horrible event that just took place. And Jada just feels really ashamed. And she says, although I knew I wasn't alone, it didn't make the moment any less painful. Seeing her condition in the isolation of our home gave a false sense of normalcy. But in public, I could not ignore the severity of my mother's addiction. It was clear that something was really wrong with her, with me, with us. But the resentment began to really surface when Adrian brought a boyfriend home. Now, up to this point, Adrian had not brought her boyfriends around after Tony and the divorce. Adrian kind of kept her love life private and didn't bring a lot of guys home. That changed when she met this guy named Anthony. Anthony was tall, dark, and handsome, but also a raging heroin addict as well. Anthony was also a thief, and he wouldn't think twice before stealing from you in order to fuel and fund his drug addiction. Between Adrian and me, in terms of jewelry, clothes, and cash, we were a decent lick for someone who knew where to look. On the outside, their house was a complete and total hole in the wall. Nobody walking past the house would have been like, oh, that place is just, you know, full of stuff that I, I might could, could use. I, I, should, I should break into that house, steal what they have. It was so obvious from the outside they had nothing. But for anybody who'd been in the house, you would know they did have a few things. At one point, stuff started going missing. Clothes, jewelry, shoes. And they couldn't figure out what was happening. Well, one day, Jada had left a bag of new clothes, shopping bag of new clothes on her bed. Same day, Adrian is missing a necklace that had belonged to their mother. She and Karen shared the necklace back and forth, but it had been in her position last. They don't know where the necklace is. They, where did the clothes go? They don't know. A neighbor comes and says, hey, you know what? I saw Tony climbing in and out of that back window and he had a whole bunch of stuff with him when he cl crawled back out. Well, of course, Anthony's a thief. I think I just called him Tony. Anthony, I'm sorry. Anthony's a thief. And the family is not super surprised, but disappointed that this is the way things have happened. Adrian asks Anthony about it. And Anthony's like, yeah, I did. I'm sorry. I did take the clothes for drug money. And rather than say, all right, well, that's that. She's just like, well, just make sure you say you're sorry to Jada. And so he's like, hey, Jada, sorry, man. That was a, a little bit of a misstep on my part. And then Adrian lets him back in the house. Well, of course, that makes Jada feel like my own home isn't safe. My mom's completely out of it all the time. But now she's bringing guys in here who are stealing from me, robbing me. And she, all he has to do is say sorry, but then he's just like let right back into the fold. Is this a joke? Uh, so that let her know that she really needed to not only start selling drugs, but really ratchet up this process. You know, she's got to find some way to make her own way on the world and make enough money where she can get away from her mom. She did this through a series of men that she pinpointed as having a sad and sorry enough sense of themselves that if she came by and stroked their egos and petted them a little, they would give all their secrets as to the best way to sell drugs. The first guy who she met, um, whose ego she decided to stroke, was this guy who she calls M. He gave her a few pointers. He sold her some drugs so that she could then start selling more drugs and then she dropped him got with this guy named bp they weren't like together like it wasn't her boyfriend that was like she was very clear about that yet it wasn't her boyfriend but she, they were she was certainly using her feminine wiles in order to get these guys to divulge information she dropped bp when she found chet chet was at the top and she said he was making his way to kingpin status she said he taught her how to be on the low 
that there shouldn't be any flashy cars or jewelry, none of that. And the second thing she had to have was she was always supposed to have a legitimate job. Always, always, always. And the third thing was she needed to have some kind of a plan. Now she lets go of the whole, I'm going to be a drug dealer narrative to let us in on the greatest character of her show to date. That would be the entrance of a Mr. Tupac. So she says that sophomore year at the Baltimore School of Performing Arts, they had a sophomore orientation. She was late on purpose because she wanted to make an entrance. All, everyone had to always be looking at her. She always had to be doing, making a thing about everything. She shows up late. She saunters in with that rat tail down her to her butt crack, as she says. As I sauntered in with my new extended rat tail down to my butt crack, I immediately catch eyes with a new dude across the room who's engaged in a very energetic conversation with one of our classmates. He's wearing a thick old school alpaca sweater and jeans. He has beautiful brown skin with big brown eyes, heavy eyebrows, and a tiny peanut head. The minute I turn and notice him, he's already staring at me. Me catching his eyes gives him the gumption to walk across the room and come right to me. Boldly, he smiles a big old smile, showing off his big old teeth, puts out his hand to shake mine. Hi, he says. I'm Tupac. I'm struck by the power of that unusual name. Tupac. His smile will become an unforgettable feature, a million watts of white teeth, and his hands feel strikingly clammy, becoming an ongoing joke between us for the duration of our friendship. The power of his presence let me know right away that he is something special. I'm Jada, I smile back. Nice to meet you, Tupac. Hi, Jada, he says. From the gate, Pac was an undeniable charismatic who could captivate any room, peanut head or not. <laughs> the fact that she calls him Pac is so stupid. I cannot even. Like, Pac? Really? Okay. He hadn't yet told me his story or that he was already making moves as a 15-year-old rapper to be the next Rakim or that he had serious acting chops, but I would soon find out all that and so much more. What I didn't expect, even with the uniqueness of his vibe, was that this young man and I would create a bond that would impact my life forever. That's shocking because nobody else remembers that, but okay. That's the end of that chapter. Now, is it just me or was that just too much to even handle? <sighs> We're really going to have to fish for the truth in these chapters, but I'm here to do that. Just the same way I was here to do it with Spare. Because you know what? Spare was full of a lot of crazy stories that no one ever talked about because everyone was too busy hitting the high notes. And everyone was keep telling the same stupid stories from that book. You know, and how many times did we have to hear about the dog bull incident, you know? And yet the book was full of crazy things that no one ever even talked about. I am here to look in Jada's book for the same little tidbits of gold that we would have missed had we not gone through Spare page after page. But listen, friends. Y'all got to quit abandoning me on this, all right? I'm not here for that. We're supposed to be doing this one together. And if you can't manage it, all right, fine, I get it. You don't have to tell me you're leaving, though, all right? You can just go. You don't have to be like, I really like you, but I'm leaving. Just go, just go. I can't handle to know that I'm being abandoned on this one. But you guys, I mean, it's like annoying, but I'm still interested. I'm still weirdly interested to find out what happened. I, I think I just really want to get to when she's like, talking about will like i want to like i want to get to all this stuff i want to hear her try to explain to me why it is that she's gone through life making all these shoddy decisions so far she's making shoddy decisions with no explanation so that's a little bit frustrating i would like her to be a little bit more insightful she does not seem to be able to manage that which is shocking for somebody who wants you to think of her as some kind of pseudo therapist i mean she'll say with her mouth i'm not really a therapist but she wants you to think of her that way anyway regardless of what she says so for somebody who really thinks a lot of themselves and their ability to sort of piece their heart and figure out what made them do what, she is completely inarticulate in her motivations as a child. So hopefully when she decides to be right about her adulthood, maybe she'll try to offer us a few tidbits so that we can at least critique why she does the things she does. At this point, she's just telling it to us with a great big old smile on her big old face to let us know that she had big old dreams and ideals and you should feel big old proud of her. All right, that's it. I'll see you guys later. Bye.